Hello everyone and welcome to the workshop. In today's video what I'll be working on is a DeWalt 20 volt max. This will be the Sawzall uh, from DeWalt's 20 volt max lineup. It is a phenomenal tool and wonderful workhorse. My uh, boss uses this and loves this tool, but it is sadly seized up on him. And uh, he's definitely gotten his use and his time out of it, but he wants to see what I can do to get it up and running again. So we're gonna take it apart and kind of take a look at some of the inner workings of it. Uh, kind of take you step by step through the whole process from everything that I'm able to see. Primarily the type of tool or screwdriver you'll be using are the Torx bits, as well as a flathead screwdriver for most of taking pretty much all DeWalt tools apart use a standard kind of Torx bit. And let's see here. All right, looks like it is a Torx 15 uh, that takes apart the handle. And that'll be the main brain of most everything that is DeWalt is housed in your hand. So that way, if you are working, you're less likely to allow your hand to go into a dangerous situation. Just kind of a natural instinct is for that not to happen. So a lot of times they put the brain of the tool right where your hand is, because if you're cutting something and something starts to go right here, you're gonna pull your hand back, you're gonna pull the tool back, and something might happen up here, but the brain of the whole thing is safe in the palm of your hand. So that's how it is with their drill sets. I'm venturing to guess it is the same in this. I have not taken these apart before, so we're gonna kinda go on a little bit of an adventure here and see exactly how this goes. I do know there is like a plastic sleeve that comes off of this front housing. Uh, the front part here is a little rusted, so I'll be taking that off as well. Uh, there's two holes through here to get those two screws off, so I'm guessing that will take off part of the face plate and we'll just kind of start going through the process of taking this apart. I'll try to take it apart best I can to where you can see exactly what I'm doing and I'll kind of list off exactly how everything is coming apart and how everything is supposed to go together at the end. And then that way we can both reference going forward and backward on this video to see exactly how it's supposed to go together. So without further ado, I'll take my Torx 15 and my flathead and we'll start taking this little jigsaw puzzle apart and start seeing what's going on with it. So my hypothesis is going to be potentially damaged brushes or corroded brushes that may have seized to the main armature going through the center of the tool. Uh, if it is something as simple as that, what I can do is pop loose the brushes and I can either give them a good clean and clean off the armature of any kind of oils, dirt, or grime that may have gone through the breather sides here, the little breather ports and potentially rusted or seized those onto there, clean that off and it may work just fine then. Worst case scenario, I might have to replace some brushes or the main armature. Now the armature itself isn't usually too expensive. A lot of times it's anywhere from $10 up to $50, but that's still cheaper than the tool itself around $180 without the kit. But with the kit, it can get cheaper. And that depends on if you have coupons or what sites you're going through. So that price is kind of relative. We'll put it at with the DeWalt name. A lot of the time you can find them on sale, you can find a variety of good deals, or like this one, it can be purchased in a larger pack of a five or plus more tool kit, and you can get it for a lot cheaper. I think this one might be $120 or $130 with no battery as well. So there are things like that as if you have the tool lineup, you'll have an extra battery, you won't mind getting another tool that doesn't have a battery. Otherwise, if you don't have a battery and you want a battery and charger, that's where I think this gets up to the 190 mark. So, yes, all that to say, let's start taking her apart and see what's wrong with it. All right, so, so far, just looking at the tool, we have one, two screws here, uh, two right where the actual battery grip is at and charging area for the unit to actually run. Uh, we have two in the handle and one on top. I'm not seeing anything else at the moment, so I'm gonna take those off. Keep in mind these screws are screwed into plastic. It is high heavy duty construction grade plastic, but at the end of the day, when you go to put this all back together, keep in mind that it is plastic. 
So you don't want to go on here with the absolute highest torquing wrench you got. If you think you can strip metal threads, just think about plastic threads. So this back screw right here, which is smaller than the rest of the screws, is a Torx 10. These have up to this point all been Torx 15s for surrounding this little screw, which is now a Torx 10. So I'll set that to kind of differentiate it itself out from the rest. So for the three screws in the front face right here, they're actually the Torx 20. So, so far we have Torx 15 primarily for the handle, except for the one little one at Torx 10. And then we have three in the front at a Torx 20. So we need that line up just to get to this point so far. So those three screws, this can pop out, and this is all just a rubber sleeve. Clean out for drywall dust, dirt and grime. I'm gonna do a little fluff and buff or sand on that to kind of get off that rust on there. So now we're looking at primary heart of the unit. Looks like we're back to the 15. So there were four screws going on the surrounding area where it is plastic to what looks to be a billet aluminum of some kind or cast aluminum. Wiggling the two apart, slides the armature right out. Oof. Yeah, it's looking like so far there are three spots on this side that are deep grooves. I'm get a little close so you can see here. Let's get focus, focus, there you go. So there are three deep grooves in the armature here and one down here. Um, my guess is, is that the brushes went off balance and made contact heavily hard on three spots. This bearing may have slid out and rolled around. Let's see, actually, oh wait, no. So this is where the magnet rests on the armature. This is where the brushes are. So this top part right here, let's see if I can get it to focus for you guys. There you go. So on the front part here, it looks like there is some green for corrosion. So that can get cleaned off. I'll probably use some denatured alcohol or just a high isopropyl content rubbing alcohol as well. We'll use to clean off any of the carbon and any of this rust here as well. Uh, you can use some light grade, very, very light sandpaper. You don't want to groove this and take a whole bunch of material, but if you're able to take off this rust, that'll create a better area for creating a contact. So far, the fins, as well for cooling right here, are not damaged. Uh, the one thing you want to look at for is if anything got in here and ricocheted around those and damaged these fins, it can throw this whole armature off balance. Even though it seems minute and this is plastic, it can very well do that, and I've seen on a few tools to where this is rattling, creating more harsh contact on your brushes, and it can also cause the two magnets that are around this, as this is spinning, to get rattled against as well. And you do have some soft spot capability due in part to that. So this being that it is a Sawzall, and this motor right here is constantly, oh, there you go, forward, back, it could very well have rattled and caused this to vibrate more so. So I'm also going to clean out any dust and debris that I'm seeing on this bearing in the back, which it still is moving pretty well. So I'm, I'm, my guess is high corrosion is probably keeping the brushes from properly sitting and resting like they should. And the magnets are not getting near enough 
connection to be able to create the current it needs based on this rust and grime. So I'm just going to do a fluff and buff, which is just some light brushing of any of this kind of sawdust and grime here from uh, this tool being obviously used. And then I'm also going to clean off any of the rust and grime up here and take a closer look to make sure nothing looks severely damaged beyond repair. Although continuing a little investigation real quick, there is one cover that pops off. So you have a large opening and then a narrow opening. So the large opening goes down into the unit and then the small opening here on top goes outside of the unit. So I'm pulling this off, setting it down upside down, exposes two more screws to get out those magnets to also be cleaned, as well as it gives me better access to the brushes in the back. So also separating the handle here, as you can see, there is a lip here that recesses on the rear and it gives you your trigger and in here in the trigger group you have on and off which also feels rather stiff. So that's your safety up here and then you have your contacts here and this is the main copper lead that your whole battery will click into. This is a floating design uh, inside the handle here for the oops, right here, uh, for the battery so that way if you're a little more aggressive with popping the battery in this doesn't have a chance to get pinched wrong and shear so it's meant to kind of float a little bit. That's one of DeWalt's designs. Uh, connections on the back look good here. No broken solder, nothing heavily corroded. Uh, there is some dirt and grime on these, so I will go through the process of cleaning those up as well. I have some brushes behind me I'll grab. As for the rest of everything, I'm not seeing any damage to any solder or anything. And then we have our brushes right here. And looking at those, so far the copper that is underneath this, which is wound, is not looking damaged. So that is good. Now we're down to these two, which are 15s. So a Torx 15 for these two. Kind of rest my thumb so I don't lose it in there. You'll be able to distinguish these from the rest because they're exceptionally long. neat thing that I've seen on here so far is on the plastic itself for this red wire uh, it says red right here so if you were to unplug these two they could get reversed but this gives you the ability to know exactly which one goes where. Let me set the trigger group aside. So just looking inside of here I can see the brushes dangling and now that these are disconnected Kind of get a look at them here. So you have a little coiled up piece of spring steel. Let me get a little closer here so you can see it. So there's a little coiled up piece of spring steel right here, helping cause the resistance against the brush. So on the inside there, kind of hard to see here, but those brushes will protrude out based on that tension of the spring, so that way they keep contact with the armature. And so far, my best guess looking at them, kind of what you guys can see a little bit of. I turn it again so that you can see inside. The brushes themselves are quite shiny and they're not showing any kind of chips or damage on them. That looks excessive and there is still a great deal of brush left. So this actually gives me a great deal of hope that this just got heavily corroded on the inside. So after brushing and sanding and cleaning this up, I have high hopes that this could very well turn on and work perfectly fine as long as all the grunt or the grime and kind of leftover remnants from inside of here are cleaned out inside of here and as well as this getting heavily buffed and cleaned.
So I'm gonna grab some of those tools and I'll be right back to sand this up and clean it all up. All right, so I went and grabbed my detail brush kit, good old Harper Freight, a couple dollar purchase. I think this was like three to five bucks, depending on if it's on sale. And I grabbed some 80 grit and some 120 grit sandpaper to kind of help with a lot of the extra gunk in certain areas that are kind of inconspicuous. <clears throat> and some, I can do a little bit on certain other parts. I don't want to get too aggressive and do any damage like I was saying earlier, but I definitely wanted some 80 grit to get that off because the brushes are nice, but they're not going to really get too high grit off. So I'm going to use the hard bristle brush, kind of knock off some of this gunk and garbage. Stepping it up to the brass brush. And a lot of this is kind of cosmetic because it's all going to go into a sleeve, so it's not necessarily a high risk or high problem, but my main concern is, is these larger chunks I don't want to just go right back into the motor and cause this issue all over again. So I'm going to get a little bit more aggressive to kind of clean that off. I'm going to wipe this down and move from there. And a lot of this is looking like it's not actually gunk, it's just tarnish. Uh, there is two more screws that I actually exposed getting a lot of this grime off. Looks like they are size 15s as well. And it looks like that will get me into this main chasm here to expose a lot of the gearing in here for the main part of this. And I will also see what kind of lubrication is used, if any at all. And I might actually kind of re-lubricate the gears in here to help keep everything just moving smoothly. those two screws off and popping this. Looks like we have some basic gears in here. You know, it kind of works off of this kind of more firm grease that uh, some of the DeWalt tools are kind of known for. It's this uh, interesting kind of uh, green grease that I've seen in a couple of the ones I've taken apart for personal use. So it looked a little bit more pressed away from the gears. So I'm going to kind of recoat the gears back up. Kind of a large chasm. Kind of redistribute it back onto the primary shaft. So you can kind of get a look inside of there. It's just a bunch of grease, but not overflowing at all. So as you use and move the tool, usually in this position, going downward, you're not always going up or at angles. It's usually primary, or it's primarily used going straight down. So everything is kind of built and designed to let that grease catch and move and stay in one spot to keep lubricating your most moving parts, which is going to be this guy right here. Going back and forth, kind of doing the wiggle in there. So just make sure that any of the grease that's on the side, you can kind of re-grab, put back onto the shaft, kind of help keep that lubricated at the fully outward position. Push it in, do the same thing, make sure that it's maintaining lubrication. And that's just one kind of good way to kind of make sure everything's staying the way it is. If you really wanted to and you felt like your grease inside of here had gotten compromised and leaked into it, then you are more than welcome to add more grease, clean this grease out, go from there as well. But looking at this grease, I would say I don't feel that any of it's compromised or damaged or getting filthy. It would necessarily need redone. I'm just kind of redistributing it into the wear areas so that way as things are kind of moving around and fluctuating everything is staying lubricated as it should. So I'm kind of re-lubricating the points that I know this shaft will go into there as such and it needs lubrication. So everything in there looks to be fine. There you go. There is a seal on the inside of here, so I'm trying not to compromise or get dirt and grime on that to cause any issues or fits. 
There's some mild Loctite on this, but it's still kind of tacky, which can happen sometimes. So I feel comfortable to reattach these and allow that to just continue doing what it was doing. Uh, if you wanted, you can still go through and re-Loctite this as well, if you feel it is necessary. But everything in here does not look too worn or too damaged in any regard to make it feel as though it needs a full refurbishment rather than just a recert on this essentially. Because a lot of times when you buy recertified tools, they're doing exactly what I'm doing. They're just maintaining the tool, making sure that it has been cleaned, re-oiled if needed. All surfaces are kind of cleaned up again to make sure all the screws are there appropriately, all the parts are there properly, and they just make sure that the tool functions as though it should having a little bit of use and wear on it. And that is the classification for recertified tools. Uh, usually a certified technician or a certified maintainer will go through and just do a product maintenance or a PM on it. And then they will resell it for a discounted rate from a brand new one, knowing that it is used, but that it is 100% capable to do the job that it is to be purchased for. There we are. All right, this bristle brush is very soft, so I feel pretty comfortable to let it do its work and just get that surface rust and corrosion off of the main spot in the armature. All right, so just kind of getting the initial brush down and clean up of that tool. That looks pretty good there. This main inner part here, Need some cleanup. So I'm just kind of cleaning up the rim of where there is rust on the outer sheathing of steel. These are the actual kind of magnetic, magnetic surfaces. So I don't really want to scrape and damage those at all. They're not rusting. It's just the outer sleeve of steel that I'm just going to kind of clean off the initial top rust so that way it doesn't gather and go into the armature. Right. Kind of curious to get this cleaned up as well. moves and actuates a lot smoother. Just rattle that off. There's a pin spot for the pin to push in. Since I have it off, got all cleaned up. At least as best we can. Here's a, a before. I'm gonna run inside and give her a quick clean or I'll just snap my fingers. And would you look at that? It's all nice and clean as best as I can, having the fact that this has actually been used. Uh, there is a little bit of almost like concrete powder or just some gypsum that does not want to leave this regardless of what kind of toothbrush or uh, degreasing soap that I use. It just kind of stays there, but it's a lot cleaner inside and out, and it will complement this being clean as well. So the next step, a friend of mine told me when he was refurbishing motors that one of his tricks is using brake parts cleaner. Reason being is, is that it does not leave any kind of oily residue like carb cleaner does. So brake parts cleaner will dry 100% super dry pretty quick, and it is a good enough solvent to pull and strip all grease and all oils off of the armature which is detrimental to the brushes and to the armature to get any kind of oil on it, even the oils off of your hands. So what you can do is just soak this down 
take a paper towel and wipe the armature slash the part of the armature where the brushes make contact as well as hitting the bearing in the end so it kind of gets some of that gunk out of there and it'll work you know 50 to 100 times better at least and this will actually usually be the one trick that kind of breathes the life back into the unit to allow all those oils and everything off so that everything can get proper current through and that there's nothing causing a greater deal of resistance on the motor keeping it from actually getting the proper current and the proper circulation of that current throughout the unit like it needs to. Uh, a lot of the times it's the smart batteries on these that sense a low current and a low draw on the battery so it senses that something's wrong with the unit so instead of the battery dying or getting killed this little part right here which is the brain will actually cause the battery to get cut off and disconnected so it'll cut the circuit going to the battery so no matter what you do with the trigger or anything on here nothing will happen because that battery senses that the unit is pulling an improper current what you can do is pull the battery put it back in and it kind of works for a second and then nothing or you have to pull the battery pull the trigger and wait 30 seconds for this to dissipate any kind of charge left in it so that way it can kind of reset itself and then it does the same thing again unless you allow that current to flow properly i.e clean your armature and make sure that your brushes are seated properly and undamaged and that usually pretty much fixes most any kind of drills so without further ado i'm going to clean that i'm also going to go into here and i'm going to try to just kind of blast in here a bit and clean out all the gunk and these magnets as well as the brushes themselves and let everything kind of drape down into a cloth in the bottom or a paper towel and allow that to just kind of come out of the unit reseat in this armature and start replenishing and re-putting everything back together and making it into a usable unit again. All right, let's take a quick second to reflect on this. So you saw this earlier. All I've done so far is lightly hit it with some brushes, a little bit of just some nylon, some brass, a little bit of the more aggressive kind of steel brush. But that's all I've done so far. And look at how clean everything is, even with those little notches in the side there, which part of that sometimes can be counterbalanced and sometimes that could be where it kind of stuck and jarred for a second and did some damage to itself. But once you clean it up, a lot of the time it doesn't matter. But you can just see how much cleaner everything is. Just with a little bit of abrasion from the brushes to get all the large chunks off and then hitting it with a solvent to help pull off all the little residual. And then taking just a dry paper towel and wiping down to get all the hard clumps and the excess runoff off. kind of using a little bit of the cleaner and just a paper towel to get in here and get any residual gunk that has gotten in with the where the blade rests or the blade holder rests so any excess kind of sawdust or drywall dust whatever this has been used on all right so i'd call that piece pretty well done I'm gonna give it one last once over, getting the extra chunks of debris off, and then I'd set that aside. Start working on the rest of it, all the other little pieces. I'm gonna work out some of that rust and gunk. The other thing I kind of did off camera is I just went through each one of the screws and lightly sanded the tips that were getting a little rusted cleaned off any of the drywall gunk that was on them, any of the excess rust or anything that was on those, just so they thread in a lot easier and work a lot better. And then kind of dry brushed a lot of the spots like this little trigger to engage and disengage in the top part right here. And you can, not absolutely drench this, but you can kind of hit lightly areas you just want to make sure to give it plenty of time to be absolutely dry 
and that you're not absolutely just holding the trigger down. I went a little heavier than I would have liked, but I wanted to get a lot of the residual gunk out of here and make everything just move and actuate right in the trigger. As close to new as I can get it with just cleaning. Cleaning off right around the actual end part for the trigger will help greatly when you're having issues with that kind of sticking a bit. A lot of the time it's just gunk right around the trigger itself. So cleaning off each one of your contacts, any copper that you see exposed, any spots you see a lot of dirt and grime and residual things that just won't make a good connection or that you're worried might get down to the connections, just wipe all that off. Wipe all your contacts and leads for where the battery is going to sit. Because even if the tool you're not 100% will actually function, you don't want to kill a battery in the, in the process by not properly cleaning off your contacts that go to the battery or cleaning off moisture on any of these connections and then just using the battery right away and causing a backflow of energy in some regard that could be arcing off of something that you didn't quite wipe down. Any number of those things could very well cause some serious detriment and death of the tool. Also go through the process of checking each one of these connections to make sure none of the solder on any of these lines is damaged. That'll also greatly stop and completely cease the existence of this working for you. Uh, so far, luckily, on this unit, I'm not seeing anything that would cause concern or worry. Uh, you can also feel the lines and kind of push on them. If there's flex and movability, you know you're good. If they're solid and stiff and there's just no movement whatsoever in them, there could be a chance that these have gotten a great deal of corrosion in them. And when these lines get corroded, a lot of the time it's kind of just dunsky and you have to try to find and reorder this component. Beauty of that is, on the back of the unit, is what the model number is uh, and as well as what the tool number is. So you can very easily search up what this tool itself has for armatures, for brushes, for trigger groups. Those are all purchasable and usually within reason so that way it is actually worth purchasing to fix a tool rather than just go out and always buy a new tool. They actually do kind of make that more accessible with DeWalt tools than I expected them to for how big of a name DeWalt has become. I glanced for a second and saw that one of the brushes had quite a bit of corrosion on it. So I'm going to kind of use some of my lighter sandpaper again, kind of clean that off ever so lightly. We don't want to rip this chunk of copper or basically uh, carbon from the actual copper uh, line that is soldered to it. So just kind of hold it and lightly hit it. You don't want to cause chipping or damage to the corners but just kind of get that surface area clean. You can use steel wool would probably be preferred. I didn't have any, otherwise I was going to. So just trying to use a finer grit of sandpaper, even if it takes longer, just don't want to absolute wear through it on your 30 grit, super crazy sandpaper. This isn't 30 grit by any means like 120 which is still a little more aggressive than it should be so the main thing we're trying to do here is get tarnish off of the actual brush itself and get buildup of carbon off of where the bristles of the brush if you will might be making contact I can see some uh, black carbon kind of fleeing away from the brush as I sprayed it which is good all right, so now I can use my nail and kind of just gently re-thread back through the brush itself. And what you want to do is check where the spring is at to make sure there is no rocks or corrosion. I had a little pebble on this one. And kind of do the same thing with the next brush. Trying to make sure that the both brushes are back in place where they're supposed to be.
All right, now that we've got our initial wipe down and everything done on the primary core of the unit, uh, sometimes a brake parts cleaner can actually pull a little too much of the color and such at a tool. But there's a trick for that that I'll show you here at the end. So for now, the next part is to take your armature and you need to very carefully thread it in. You need to pull apart your brushes and you need to adjust and slide in your armature. So gently kind of give it a little pull to see that these are moving and actuating. Kind of look through on the side here to see that your armature is where it needs to be placement wise. And now what we can do is run these four screws. Hang on one sec, I missed one part. All right, so what you want to do before you slide that in is these two longer screws need to go in to help hold the magnet in place to this actual casing. You might be able to get them out. I was having too difficult of a time. I didn't want to do damage or anything, so I left them in. There we are. And now the same basis again in reverse. All right, my apologies. So what you want to do is slide this piece in, lock it up like that. And then for your brushes, uh, what you want is the wire coming out of the top of the little white piece here. So on your brush, it's offset. One side will have where it is soldered with that wire. You want to put that as the wire is on the top, not the bottom. Uh, of the spring and then you want to just kind of gently wiggle move that back into place so that way with a little bit of pressure you can get your brush to push and to press that spring slightly what you want to do is you can lightly apply that pressure and then just kind of lock those in on the sides and then you can take this unit, making sure that this is facing down for the belly, for where it says DeWalt. Be gentle with the magnets on the side. Try to be careful, I know it's, it's very difficult. Here we go. And with a little bit of wiggling, and that unit should slide right together and should be set to go. So what we'll need now are the four longest screws that remain. And we're going to screw those in. These screws, again, are a Torx 15. And since this is a pressure fit, what you wanna do is do one side almost all the way tight Get it pretty close. And flip it over. Get the next one pretty close. Alright, now go back to your first one, tighten it down all the way. Next one, tighten it down all the way. And in doing that, it kind of pulls the whole unit in uniformly. You can also just go on to the next screw, get it close, next screw, get it close, and kind of go in a cross pattern. This is something that's overboard. It's just kind of something that I like to do on a lot of tools just to make sure that everything's kind of put together straight. And for something like this, it takes a lot of jarring and a lot of jostling being a sawzall. Uh, it doesn't hurt to kind of make sure that everything's as tight a unit as it can be. Alright, once you know that everything is nice and tight on here, kind of just going in reverse of what I did before, on the front foot, uh, you'll see here, let me kind of clean this up. On the front foot here, you'll see this kind of spot in the top right corner here for this to go into. And that should just rest right inside of there and actuate and kind of pivot and turn. You want the lock facing upward towards presentable from this side. 
and that just kind of sits off to the side. Then we slide back on our protective sleeve here for overheating, uh, heat dissipation. Uh, there's a couple other benefits to why they do this. So that just slides on nice and firm. And then we want to take this unit and kind of pull it back out a little. And we want to slide in that tab. What you can do also is just kind of remove the tab, pop it into where it's about to rest, and then you can slide the foot over that. The foot should hold the pin for this tab and nestle in nice and neat into the actual unit itself. And then you should be able to just slide them all nice and firm. There is a guided path on this side for that arm to slide into. You'll see it pretty neat. Uh, it goes down and kind of makes a 90 off to the side and that kind of goes up and hooks into it for this little flap. And then that'll give you the ability to kind of open and close the jaws on there to put a blade in. So continuing on onward from the way that we had originally designed to put this or put this together. The next step is to put on the three screws in front. These are the Torx 20 screws. So kind of hold on and rest your hands on it and then slide through the front to get the first one in and started. Get it close but don't get it all the way. There is a little bit of a wobble to this so you might need to kind of fish slightly for the next screw. So don't absolutely go ham and super tighten that down because you're just going to end up having to loosen it up to get the other holes to line up properly. It's close, but it's not super crazy comfortable to get to the next one. So instead of causing yourself agitation, just take a second. And even if it seems like you're having a little extra work, it just works out better in the end. All right, once you have all three started, you can just finish off the last one that you ended with. Make sure it's fully tight. Keep kind of a downward pressure on the neck here. Nothing super crazy, just enough to keep it secure so it doesn't slide up. Makes tightening these a lot easier. Keeps everything flush and doesn't wiggle out. And at this point, you should still be able to visibly see that pin sticking through from the flap on the side. And if you don't see it and you see an indentation, then stop, take those three screws out, slide this up because you have this in the wrong spot. All right, and so far we have the front of the Sawzall completed. This is tightened up a bit, so that way it still actuates and moves. Before it was pretty well solid in one position and you could have to really fight it to get to move. Now it just kind of stays where you want it to, which is what you want. You don't want it just rattling until you make contact with whatever you're cutting. That just gets very, very annoying and it gives you an unguided cut that is also dangerous in the long haul. All right, shifting gears back to the trigger. At this point now, everything should be 100% dry. Uh, the brake parts cleaner does dry pretty fast, but giving a little extra time just kind of is a a good idea in general. I kind of wipe all this down and out, making sure that none of this dirt and grime gets back into any of your control board or where your battery rests or any part of where your brush is that you just took all this time to clean. You don't want any of that debris or kind of garbage to get back in there and cause you to have to go through the whole process next week or the next day to do all the same thing again to clean your unit up just back the way you had it a moment ago. And using the nylon brush is nice because I can kind of get out large chunks of dirt or grime without having to get really far into those crevices with any kind of solvents or cleaners, I can just kind of knock the large chunks out of the way. All right, and for this unit that mark that I made note of before where it says red. 
even though these are both black, gives you the knowledge to know that this is where the red fin tab clicks in. And then your other will be, of course, the black. That pops in. Now looking at this unit, you can kind of see how these curl. Just kind of let them go back the way they were before. Looking at your handle, kind of rest and put that back in. Keeping an eye on exactly that there are no pinch marks or any damages to any of the leads. Pop it back in. Make sure everything is in a good position that's not going to get damaged. Slide your trigger back into place. Same thing with the little memory board and the pickup for the battery. You'll find little nesting spots for those to kind of sit and rest in. Now as for the top piece, once this is fully mounted in, you want to take this piece and make sure to kind of run the cabling to where it is also kind of out of the way again. There's an actual little track on the top part to help with that. Keep an eye on that everything gets in where it needs to be so you're not forcing any wires together and causing any damage or detriment. So once you have everything pretty well lined up, you want to set it down, kind of open the back up a little bit on the top. Reason being we're doing this is that we still need to put this piece back in. So for this, you would push in and it would lock, push this side, it would unlock. So we know it rests in like this. Make sure that goes underneath the wires. There's a little track on the top part here where those wires can get nestled up top. So make sure those go over top of the switch so that way you're not pushing into them causing damage. On the switch there is a little track for that toggle to go into that you'll see on top of the trigger that acts as your safety. So you're going to want that in there. You want to set this in such a way that it's able to recept into both handles nice and easily. Might take a little finagling. Just keep track of where your wires are at to make sure that nothing is going to get pinched. Best you can at least. Another thing while we're right here is there is the little spring part that will have popped out on you guys that goes right in the back here to help press forward for your battery. There's a little square receptor for the spring to rest on and then there is a little track on the back part of the handle for half of the crescent moon to set and rest in on one side and then the other half will go on the other side. A little bit at least. You'll see kind of a gentle slope on this actual toggle switch angling in a downward this direction. Uh, so you'll want to make sure that that is pointing down from where it's at now. So that way it goes in the proper one direction or the other to let you know if it's on safety or if it's off. And it kind of can only go that one direction. So it's not a huge detriment or something you're going to feel like, oh my gosh, is that in the right way? You'll notice pretty quickly if you have it in the wrong setup. So don't fret too much or worry heavily over that. Alright, so kind of press, check to make sure nothing is getting pinched. Kind of keep an eye on and look through everything, which looks to be good. Make sure your bottom is lined up properly and that spring is where it needs to be. Applying that pressure to your floating back here. Alright. So now at this position, what you want to do is flip it over, label down, and then you'll have your screws. All of them are the same except for this last little one. That was the last one I took out, and that one took the 10, and it wasn't in there super duper tight. So you should be able to do it by hand. Like I said earlier, and at the very beginning, this is all plastic. So don't feel you have to over crank and over kill every single one of these screws. 
if you sense or feel that they are getting loose, feel free to tighten them, but don't feel like it is such a detriment and such a need to absolutely crank these things down because you will crack the plastic. You'll strip them out and you'll do damage or you'll get it so cross-threaded in the plastic that there is no hope of ever really getting it out again. All things to consider and none of them are really good in that regard. So for me, I'm not kind of really following the same pattern I did before. Reason being is I'm trying to hit your outer areas. So I hit the dead center, I hit the top, and I hit a bottom point. I'm going to go for the top metal as well next. So that way I get kind of all around pressure, helping hold everything together. Nothing pops apart on me. Get everything moderately tight. Don't need to absolutely kill it. Again, this is plastic. All right, oh my gosh, it works. You can hear it. No issues or problems. The little release works perfectly. You can kind of see it there. It's a lot cleaner. <laughs> It's not a bad tool. I've always wanted one of these too. Uh, so when he said, hey, can you clean this up for me? I was like, oh, because I, I technically kind of still want to pick one of these up. Uh, the toolkits that I've picked up gave me a hammer drill and gave me a speed charger, but I never spent the extra amount to get one with the Sawzalls out as well. And I have a corded one that has done me well, but this is something eventually I think I'm gonna have to pick up because it's a good tool. I have the 20 volt lineup and I can't say anything bad about them. Everything fits really nice and really snug. Now that everything is cleaned out for gunk wise, that spring is exactly where it needs to be. Everything is nice and tight. Uh, the safety does work, so I won't have the ability to pull a trigger until I push that safety back in and it just works perfectly. I'm super stoked. I was actually a little leery at first not knowing kind of a Pandora's box I was getting into, how seized or how damaged everything was in here, and I am very happy to report that it was just gunk and grime and it is 100%. Alright, so this tool is fully functioning 100% and just because I did, I love doing it. It works. It works great. It works as though it's been recertified or remanufactured and I'm super stoked about that. It's a very simple process that anyone can do. Uh, you will need to have those three sizes. So you need a Torx 10, a Torx 15, and a Torx 20 to get into the unit. Everything else past that is basically very simply pulled apart by hand. You can use the assistance of a flat bladed screwdriver. Just be very careful not to mark corners or edges or anything like that. I was able to use just my hands and it came apart very easy for me. Now that's dependent as well as if you were to get one of these used to want to breathe life back into it. You don't know what the prior owner has done to it as far as if he's got bubble gum inside of it, if he's got a variety of different things that he's worked with, uh, gypsum being one of the primary ones that kind of kill these eventually, is how harmful and how gummy that can get when it gets moisture in it or any kind of oil on it from the unit or from anything you're lubricating while you're cutting or anything else you may have cut and then going to drywall can kind of cling and pull into the unit and cause some detriment. So just what you can do to kind of clean that out is if you haven't, I suggest it highly. This little brush kit from Harbor Freight, it, on sale it's like a $2 purchase or a $3 purchase. It's like $2.99 or $1.99 for a pack of these and it's five brushes or sorry, six brushes. And the primary three I used was just the large nylon, the kind of steel brush, and the brass brush. Uh, the sandpaper I used, you can use just like 100 grit or steel wool would probably be preferred. I just, like I said earlier, I didn't have any on me, but that would give you the ability to kind of feel it out and get it to where you want it. It might take a second longer than you really want it to, but it will also have the ability to kind of push into the pores and work a lot better. Sandpaper will work more on a flat plane even if you contour it. So you're not going to get into the crevices of it. That's why I was going over with the brushes heavily on the armature to kind of help pull any flux of rust or any flux of dirt, grime and debris out of the actual armature itself because I knew that that was what was causing the issue in the beginning. From what I could tell and everything, there was a slight pop. So those brushes had 
kind of pseudo held on to the armature itself. The armature had rust on it. There was a lot of dirt and grime in there from just use which I have to commend anyone that uses a tool because I feel the actual detriment and death of any real tool is someone that goes out and purchases it, mounts it up on a wall, and then just walks away from it. I just feel so sad for every one of those tools because they never get used. And they just sit there and collect dust, not sawdust, not metal shavings, not anything actually utilizing and using the tool for what you purchased it for. So kind of getting out there and utilizing it is just like any kind of artist or anything else you can have a canvas you can have a marker a pencil what have you for your medium but if you're not actually putting anything to paper if you're not actually building anything you're kind of just at a loss for why do you even have this <laughs> so i commend them for using it i'm happy to see that and i'm more than happy to fix up things when people ask me to because if it needs fixing it means that it got used and if it got used it means that it actually was worth purchasing and they've had a lot of fun using it and from what I can tell, he loves this tool. He's used it a great deal. He'll get a lot more use out of it. I see I would buy this in his current condition, kind of de-resting and kind of letting this be able to move again. So whatever you're resting against, you can kind of apply that pressure, get that articulation, and it holds shape. It's not super loose and just kind of flopping around, getting in the way. As soon as you start kind of making your cut, it stays in place doesn't just wiggle like crazy. I've had that in the past in construction and it drove me nuts. You almost find yourself kind of holding it down with your finger right next to a blade oscillating and that's just not safe for anyone. So hopefully you've enjoyed this how to clean and how to fix up a DeWalt 20 volt max uh, sawzall and this has hopefully been able to kind of shed some light and give you that gusto to feel like okay yes this is something i can do i can salvage that tool that i love and i can salvage that item that i want to have in the shop that i need for the next project what have you i'm just hoping hoping that somebody gets out of this video uh kind of a sense of the time and effort that was put into it and hopefully it'll be good content that will help you be able to push yourself and keep moving on and keep creating for whatever you're doing whether it's your job your hobby or if it's just something that needs done around the house. Hopefully this will help you out and hopefully you enjoy the channel. If you have, make sure and like the video and make sure and also subscribe to the channel. It helps me out greatly. It gives you the ability to know exactly what I'm up to. It shows me that everyone enjoys the content and that way it also kind of helps me see which way I need to move with the content. And if you haven't already, make sure and hit the notification bell. It costs you nothing, takes no time at all. And then that way, every time I upload a video, you can see if you like it. If not, scroll on by. But it gives you the notification of what I'm up to. And if it's something that helps you out that you might not have been thinking about, it'll just pop up in your phone or on your email. So thank you very much. Have yourself a wonderful day. And good luck.